I would now like to introduce to you our, our guest speaker for tonight. And we're very honoured and, and very privileged to have the Honourable David Harper, AMQC, address us tonight on the topic of sentencing and the courts, justice, the media and public opinion. Just by way of introduction to you all, I'm sure many, if not most of you, know of uh, David Harper, but he was a barrister in 1970 to 1992, and he was appointed to Queen's Council in 1986, and became chair of the Victorian Bar Council in 1990 to 1991. Interestingly and importantly, he was president of the Graduate Union, the University of Melbourne, 1997 to 1999. Many of you would have been here at that time. He became judge of the Supreme Court of Victoria from March 1992 until June 2013. Uh, Court of Appeal from November 2009 until June 2013. President of the Victorian Association for the Care and Resettlement of Offenders. Uh, and has been the patron of that organisation since 2012. Chair of the International Humanita Humanitarian Law Committee. Of Victoria, uh, Victoria and the Australian Red Cross since 2001, President of the International Commission of Jurists, Victorian branch, Member of the Law Reform Commission of Victoria, President of the Judicial Conference of Australia, Member of the Order of Australia since 2008 for service to law reform, the judiciary and in the area of international humanitarian law and to the community through support services for the care and resettlement of offenders and their families. And uh, finally, a member of the Council of the Australian Institute of International Affairs until 2013. So you'll see a very distinguished jurist uh, and gentleman. And uh, I welcome you, David, to the podium to uh, talk to us tonight. inviting me to speak this evening. It is a great honour to be back and uh, um, delighted to have the opportunity to talk about something which is dear to my heart, um, both through uh, my job as a judge of the Supreme Court and also through my um, association with the, what in effect was the old Prisoners Aid Society, now ACRO, um, which has as its object the um, welfare of prisoners and their families um, in ways which will prevent recidivism. What I'm about to say will be a little controversial because, as you'll gather, I'm no fan of the tabloid media. Um, <laughs> and I shall introduce um, my remarks by saying that I do not speak for the court. Um, I haven't shown what I'm going to say to Chief Justice or any other member of the court. Um, and I don't speak either for uh, Macro, which is uh, raised in the Rosemary Hill set up sort of associated. I will start with um, the House of Commons, Hansard, 20 July 1910. Winston Churchill, Home Secretary. The mood and temper of the public in regard to the treatment of crime and criminals is one of the most unfailing tests of the civilization of a country. A calm and dispassionate recognition of the rights of the accused against the state and even of convicted criminals against the state, a constant heart searching by all charged with the duty of punishment, desire and eagerness to rehabilitate in the world of industry all those who paid their dues in the hard coinage of punishment, tireless efforts towards the discovery of curative and regenerative processes, and an unfailing faith that there is a treasure, if only you can find it, in the heart of every man and woman. These are the symbols which, in the treatment of crime and criminals, mark and measure the stored up strength of a nation and are the sign and proof 
of living virtue in it. These words are often referred to by those interested in crime and punishment. They do not, however, find an audience within the corridors of Australia's tabloid media, nor do they resonate in the passageways and offices of Parliament House. Calmness, dispassion, logic and rationality are wanderers in a foreign land when the administration of criminal justice is under consideration. They are held at bay by their opposites. Irrationality, narrowness of vision, and concern for profit and party political advantage. Societies operate their best when self-interest and the interests of the community run as closely as possible in tandem. For example, the ethic of helping, one, helping one's neighbour is built into most small communities because it is buttressed by the knowledge that next time my neighbour will help you. For all its faults, properly regulated capitalism is the most efficacious means of managing the distribution of goods and services, except for those which only government can provide. The opposite is also true. Decency and good policy will always surrender to self-interest if the relevant societal structures divorce self-interest <laughs> from the common good. The point is illustrated by the aspect of the administration of criminal justice, which I want to examine this evening. Justice, the, the connection is useful for this group because criminal justice sits on a fault line between, on the one hand, the self-interest of a significant element of the media, and on the other, the interest of society as a whole. It is in society's interest that the consideration and formulation of best practice in this difficult area <coughs> be firmly set on a sound footing. Otherwise, it cannot meet the standards so eloquently postulated by Churchill. It must be evidence-based. It must be devoid of irrational and emotive reasoning. Above all, it must be balanced in its resolution of the inevitable conflict between, on the one hand, the circumstances which aggravate the seriousness of the crime, and on the other, those which go in mitigation. Sentencing, sentencing judges are required to consider both. The difficulty is that the aggravating circumstances pull in one direction, mitigating circumstances in the other. How does the judge give proper weight to each? Not by adding a year's imprisonment for this aggravating factor and subtracting six months for that mitigating circumstance. The law requires a process of synthesis. Pluses and minuses all go into the mix, while the judge, who must accept responsibility for the final result, attempts to reconcile the irreconcilable. The tabloid media are untroubled by this problem. <laughs> it is in their interest to pretend that it doesn't exist. Their interest lies not in balance, but in bias to emphasise that which aggravates while ignoring or at least barely mentioning that which mitigates. It is in their interest to camouflage reason while giving exposure for raw emotion, to have regard to preconceptions rather than to the evidence, and to comment on particular sentences and on sentencing in general, not with objectivity, but so as to generate outrage. Above all, it is in their commercial interest to put their profitability before best practice in the management of the criminal justice system. Judged by the media's own rights, their success is unqualified. The community is outraged by what it perceives to be leniency in sentencing. Academic study after academic study, here and elsewhere in the common law world, 
highlights the close correlation between media portrayal and public perception. That is, a weak courts, lenient sentences, a failure to protect the community, and the need for politicians to inject into the administration of criminal justice the toughness which the government rightly demand. But these studies also conclude that there is a difference between perception and the fact of leniency. The better informed the public is, the more it tends towards informed rationality and therefore away from punitiveness in punishment, but with no tendency towards undue leniency. The tabloid media's sin is to create the perception of unwarranted leniency while ignoring the worth of informed rationality. Then, having conjured this distorted picture, the tabloids arrive at a beautifully self-serving conclusion. Namely, that they have the ability, peculiar to themselves, to gauge community sentiment. They begin by satiating us, the public, with the aggravating circumstances of a myriad of criminal behaviours, but without reference to those mitigating factors which justice requires the court to take into account. The tabloids then tell us that we demand more punitive sentences. We, of course, being outraged, agree. Armed with this Versailles agreement, the tabloids next step is to require politicians to act upon it, and they instruct the courts to either meet the demand for increased severity in sentencing or suffer a further loss of community confidence. This, they unblushingly remind the courts, would be sad, because such confidence is necessary if society is to function as it should. In the meantime, we are busy destroying whatever confidence there <coughs> might remain. When they behave in this way, the tabloids are not disseminating views. This is the opposite of the media telling the public what the public has a right to know. It is the tabloids searching for an audience and at the same time enhancing their political influence and commercial interests by denying the public the right to know. It's a truism to say that in a democracy the right to know is of prime importance. It is equally true that the media perform an, an essential role in ensuring that that right is given substance. But on issues of sentencing, the public's right to know takes second place if it stands between a tabloid media and a good story. Political influence and commercial interests are powerful motivators. The success of the tabloid stance on sentencing, and therefore also on the financial benefit they will reap in adopting the be tough on criminals position depends upon the public not being given information which the public must have if a balanced view of the relevant considerations and a balanced judgment about competing priorities is to be made. It comes back to the assumptions which for the tabloid media are axiomatic. First, that it knows what the public wants. And secondly, that what the public wants is tougher sentencing. More particularly, it comes back to a question of tabloid priorities. Under its order of things, information necessary to enable the interested inquirer to perform a balanced view about contested issues concerning sentencing is placed so far in the background that it can never influence general public opinion. Why? Because if it did, the tabloid would be as passionate but, un but one-dimensional approach to sentencing would be exposed in all its inadequacy. And at the same time, one of that media's significant commercial assets, the ability to pronounce on the shocking failure of the course to deliver criminal justice, would vanish. Typical of the studies into the, into the reality and perception of sentencing is a paper entitled Myths and Misconceptions, Public Opinion versus Public Judgment about Sentencing. It 
It was published in July 2006 by the Sentencing Advisory Council of Victoria, an important statutory body established in 2004 to allow, among other things, properly informed public opinion to be taken into account in the sentencing process. The very thing that the tabloid media abhors. So, although the Council's report <coughs> ought to be the point of first recourse to a media concern about sentencing, those reports are either lampooned or, more often, ignored. The Myths and Misconceptions report contained the following passage quote, Newspaper portrayals of crime stories report selectively, choosing stories and aspects of stories with the aim of entertaining or informing. They tend to focus on unusual, dramatic and violent crime stories in the process of painting a picture of crime that, if, that overestimates the prevalence of crime in general and of violent crime in particular. Thus, public concerns about crime typically reflect crime as depicted in the media rather than trends in the actual crime rate. The news media also provide little systemic information about the sentencing process or its underlying principles. As people are overly influenced by single case information, people false, falsely generalise that leniency characterises the entire sentencing process. End quote. The consequences are serious. The principle among these is that confidence in the administration of criminal justice, and more particularly, confidence in the courts, is tangibly diminished. But an independent judiciary, which has the confidence of the community, is an essential element in a properly function, functioning democratic polity. Of course, the judiciary must earn that confidence. The media have not merely a right, but a duty to expose failings in the judicial system. But it, it is quite wrong for one segment of the media to attack the system not for its actual certain actual shortcomings, but the faults it does not have. Faults which the commercial gain are wrongly attributed to it. This is a serious charge. It is not made lightly. The media constitute too important an element in a democracy to be a subject of a careless suggestion that in one respect, one segment of it, does democracy a disservice. Irresponsible reportage by the media is no warrant for equal irresponsibility by its critics, in which you will get at arm one. So the charge is based, I think, upon evidence which seems to me to be compelling. <coughs> It is, again, evidence based upon vigorous research across the jurisdictions of the English-speaking world. The results of this research are summarised in the 2006 Myths and Misconceptions paper. Quote, when people are given more information, their levels of punitiveness drop dramatically. Public sentencing preferences are actually very similar to those expressed by the judiciary or actually used by the courts, end quote. On 11 February 2011, the then Federal Minister for Home Affairs and Justice, Brendan O'Connor, released a report entitled Public Judgment on Sentencing, Final Results from the Tasmanian Jury Sentencing Study. It's published jointly by the Australian Government and the Australian Institute of Criminology. It contained the results of what continues to be the most important research conducted in Australia on attitudes to sentencing. Well, in, the, in the interest of time, I omit to tell you who the researchers were, but they were very eminent uh, academic lawyers. The subjects of research were members of Tasmanian juries. When looked at in the light of the nature and purpose of the research, the number of jurors involved was significant, 698. <coughs> Each had a qualification which, in the context of research into attitudes to sentencing, was 
peculiarly significant. Each jury had sat on a jury in a criminal trial which had resulted in a verdict of guilty. Each, therefore, was fully acquainted with the evidence called in that trial. 138 such trials were involved. Every member of these 138 juries was invited by the judge to participate in the study by remaining in court to listen to the sentencing submissions. Before the sentence was imposed, all 698 jurors who agreed to participate in this way completed a questionnaire which asked them, among other things, to give their views about levels of sentencing generally. In the words of the report, quote, to avoid the limitations of answering a single question about sentencing levels, the study asked jurors to distinguish between four kinds of crimes, violence, property, drug, and sex offences. The question asked whether jurors thought that current sentences were much too tough, a little too tough, about right, a little too lenient, or much too lenient. Across all offences types, the majority responded as the media would have expected, that sentences were too lenient. This was most pronounced for sex and violence offences, with 80% and 76% respectively of jurors saying that sentences in those areas were too lenient. During this first stage of the study, the jurors were also asked about the incidents in Tasmania of the same four <coughs> categories of crime, how often they happen. To quote again from the report, recorded crime rates had been declining for about five to ten years, nationally and in Tasmania. Nevertheless, only 7% of respondents thought that crime had decreased and 27% thought it had significantly increased. And then further statistics, which I won't go into now, but all of which showed that when jurors looked at sentencing generally, they all thought that courts were too lenient. That was the first stage of the study. In the second stage, after the jurors knew that the sentence that had actually been pronounced in the case over which they had been the jurors, each was asked for his or her assessment of that particular sentence. According to the report, quote, there was a high overall level of satisfaction with judicial sentencing. Ninety uh, percent said that the sentence was appropriate, evenly split between very appropriate and fairly appropriate. Jurors were also asked whether their opinion about sentencing in general had changed. Remember how high they were in general? It had, although a substantial majority remained of the view, of the view that whatever happened in their case, sentences generally were still too low. <laughs> Thus, in stage one, 80% of, of uh, jurors had thought that sentences for sexual offences were too lean. But that figure changed to 70% by the second stage. And for offences involving violence, the figure of 71% of had dropped to 66%. Still a very high level of general dissatisfaction. Mm. It was likely that among the jurors who thought that the particular sentence in the case over which they had presided was other than very appropriate, were some who, had the decision been theirs, would have imposed a more severe sentence than the judge. Accordingly, having for this purpose, excluded the jurors who thought that the sentence was very appropriate, but no one need to ask them anymore. The remaining jurors were asked to indicate what, in their opinion, the sentence should have been. 52% of those who assessed the sentence as less than very appropriate opted for increased leniency. A little more than a third, 37.5%, thought that the judge should, imp should have imposed a more severe sentence. The report concluded, quote, the fact that 52% of jurors chose a more lenient sentence than the judge shows that informed members of the public are not as punitive as many representative surveys have suggested, surveys that the media themselves have conducted. <coughs> this finding mirrors previous vignette studies that have also reported that when views of members of the public on a specific case 
are compared with those of judges, the judges' sentences tend to be as severe or more severe than those of the public. When releasing a report on February 2011, Minister O'Connor said, this study reveals that a majority of jurors give a more lenient sentence than the one imposed by the trial judge. And he went on to enlarge upon that. He concluded by saying, this study should give comfort to the judiciary as they conduct their very important work. <coughs> it did give comfort to the judiciary, but it was and remains a severe embarrassment to the Tamil <coughs> media. There was and is no present means by which they can counter-attack. Until a wider Australian cohort of viewers throws up some different conclusion, and there's no reason to think that it would, the Tasmanian jury sentencing study remains as the touchstone against which public sentiment, informed public sentiment, must be judged. But that's not how the media see it. <coughs> Newspapers not in the business of not in the business of creating sentencing sensations reported the launch of the Tasmanian study and spoke to its implications and gave an honest assessment. Mm. So far as I'm aware, however, no tabloid newspaper referred to that study on or close to the day of its publication, which remember the February. 2011. It was certainly not until 18 March that year, some six weeks later, that the Herald Sun informed its readers of the report's existence. And when it did, the reference appeared in a single column on page 38. <laughs> the conclusions of the study were diluted, almost to the point of invisibility. The ABC Media Watch wrote to the Herald Sun about this, quote, research shows that the more information the public has about sentencing, the less it persists in the belief that sentencing is too lenient. In particular, the recent Tasmanian jury sentencing study showed that people who had served on juries in particular cases overwhelmingly felt that sentences in those cases were appropriate and more often felt that they were too severe and too lenient. This important survey was reported on page 38 of your newspaper a month after the results were published. Given the prominence that the Herald Sun has given stories that confirm the published belief that sentencing generally is too lenient, do you consider that this coverage was adequate? <laughs> the editor responded by totally ignoring the vital distinction <laughs> between the attitude of the jurors to sentencing in general and their attitude of the sentence pronounced in a particular case. In answering the question whether he considered that the coverage in the Herald Sun was adequate, the editor said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> then, ignoring the problem that 90% of the jurors were of the opinion the sentence was either adequate or very adequate, the editor continued, quote, I also note that according to the survey you describe as important, 66% of jurors felt sentences for violent, for violent offense, offenses were too lenient, 70% felt sentences for sexual offenses too lenient, 46% felt sentences for property offenses too light, and 49% felt sentences for drug offenses too lenient. In the context, the editor must have known that this was at best an evasive answer. The relevant passages from the jury study, study report highlight the difference between what the editor chose to say or see and what he chose to ignore. Quote, this is from the report, the study report. 66% 60, of respondents thought that sentences for violent offences were too lenient, even though only 35% want a more severe sentence in a particular case they deliberated on. For sex offences, 70% thought that sentences were generally too lenient, although only 46% want a more severe sentence in their case. For property offences, 46% of sentences were too lenient generally, but only 20% wanted a more severe sentence in the case they deliberated on. 
and for drug offences, 49% said the sentences were too lenient generally, but 46% wanted a more, only 46% wanted a more se severe sentence in the case upon which they acted as due. Um. End quote. <coughs> as it was then, so it is now. The tabloid media promotes its own surveys of its readers, which always demonstrate their concern about leniency in sentencing, while treating the Tasmanian jury study as if it had never taken place. So, for example, on 1 April 2011, less than three months after the results of that study had been released, the Herald Sun described as a joke a research paper published in March 2011 by the Sentencing Advisory Council. The paper was entitled Alternatives to Imprisonment, Community Views in Victoria. It found that 74% of those surveyed strongly supported increasing alternatives to imprisonment such as supervision, treatment and community service. The Council's research had followed and had flowed on from a national survey of public perceptions on sentencing funded by the Australian Research Council. There were 300 Victorian participants selected at random from a cohort of 1,200 also selected at random. The statistics upon which those surveyed were asked to form their opinions were not confined to Victoria, but were based on the of Australia. The basis for the Herald Sun's characterisation of the research paper as a joke was that only 300 Victorians were surveyed and that they were not told that, in the newspaper's words, quote, violent crime has been rising rapidly in Victoria. You may remember that the Tasmanian sentencing study led by two eminent legal academics had based their premises on their own research which showed that uh, crime in Australia generally and in Tasmania in particular had been decreasing for 10 years before 2011. So the Herald Sun got its figure from goodness knows where. Well, um, time forbids me um, continuing with the detailed uh, account of the sins of the media, but could I conclude and leave some time for questions by briefly taking you to um, a survey which the Herald Sun conducted, I think as an annual uh, event for, for the newspaper, earlier this year. It was on issues um, that should concern the um, community generally, and one of those issues, of course, was sentencing. The Herald Sun only surveyed its own readers. Uh, some 8,000 of them responded. The Herald Sun asked them such questions as, do you think crime is increasing? And 82% said yes. Uh, the Herald Sun asked them about whether their readers felt more secure than before, and I've forgotten the figure, but something like 78% said yes, they felt more, less, less secure now than before. Uh, they all wanted more police on the streets, um, and so on. <coughs> the uh, Herald Sun's description of the very meticulous survey conducted by the Victorian Sentencing Council as a joke, when compared with his own um, surveys that are absolutely a joke, is quite extraordinarily, um, <coughs> we have to find the right word. Uh, um, audacious. Audacious. <laughs> and of course, the Herald Sun, uh, with the, um, not only the consent, but the support of the Victorian government, after it was first elected, the present government, conducted another survey, again of Herald Sun readers, um, in which the readers were asked to look at 17 separate incidents. They were given a couple of paragraphs which, um, from which they were supposed to draw their conclusions about the aggravating and the, and the uh, mitigating circumstances. A couple of paragraphs where a judge sits and listens for a day, perhaps two days, to hear a plea uh, from the accused counsel and the Crown on what the sentence should be, on what the sentence should be. And from 
that very media, that size of information, the Herald Sun's readers came back with what was the obvious and inevitable response. They all said that sentencing was far too low, and in these particular cases, sentences that were imposed were ridiculous. It does seem to me that um, in this respect, democracy is being badly serviced by the tabloid media. I don't include all media. Uh, I don't include, um, for example, the um, what used to be the uh, broadly Fairfax uh, newspapers and all the Australian, although it is, Australia is a um, stable base of most, if not all, of the tabloids in Australia. But uh, the fact that this relentless campaign by the tabloids to shock their readers, because that gives them um, the readership they desperately need, is uh, a very poor result for democracy. And if I could only if it just quickly refer to one aspect. There are now over 6,000 6, uh, um, sentenced prisoners in Victoria. Uh, it costs us, the taxpayer, $290 a day, sorry, $270 on average, to uh, keep those prisoners in food uh, and with appropriate health care and so on. That amounts to $1,600,000 per day for us to pay for our prisoners, which is something like um, six and a half million Six and a half, six, six hundred five, six sorry, six hundred fifty million dollars per year. It's a huge expense, and you might think that it could better be spent on programs of rehabilitation that have some prospect of success, on health, on welfare, on education, on any number of things. And yet, because of the tabloids' obsession with um, getting as many people to jail as possible, that money is not spent as well as it should be. Thank you for your attendance, and I'll be happy with your attention. Um, your, uh, Going to the state government in this state is introducing a method of sentencing called baseline sentencing. That means that instead of the judges being at large to impose a penalty, the penalty starting point is about halfway between a particular range, and it's generally a matter for the defence and the prosecution, but more for the defence to convince the judge why he should depart from that um, particular baseline. The seriousness of the defence course will uh, um, enable him to consider a higher penalty and mitigating factors and less serious matters will allow the judge uh, to impose a penalty which is less. Uh, it's been trialled on only four um, sorts of offences at this stage and they're basically sex um, offences to the person and sexual offences. I wonder if you would comment on that uh, system. It hasn't been going for long enough to uh, make any true assessment. The Herald Sun um, published what it said was a draft letter from the Chief Justice and the Chief Judge to the Attorney General in which, according to the Herald Sun, um, those two heads of jurisdiction said that the new sentencing regime would, re would complicate an already complicated process and make it almost impossible and would uh, add to length of sentences so that uh, there'd be additional cost in the sentencing process and an additional cost in maintaining even more prisoners inside jail. I don't know whether that letter was ever drafted, let alone sent, um, but I think it is obvious that if you have to, as, as a sentencing judge, try to assess whether or not the particular crime for which you are sentencing a now convicted offender fell within the baseline or fell above it or below it, 
and then had to decide whether you give the baseline sentence, which would be required of you, if you, if you found it was a baseline case, or whether you go high or low if it wasn't. All that would necessarily take a great deal of time, and the overall result would necessarily be more prisoners, because baseline sentences are very much higher than current sentencing practice. The, the general level which the judges themselves have set for these crimes that Kingsley mentioned. I was going to ask a similar question. Um, basically, to what extent did, did the politicians take note of the need for baseline sentencing as per your results? I mean, the county, so, so you, you, you preempted my question, basically, is obviously means that the politicians have been uh, have been abetted by, by this populist approach. I think there's no doubt. Um, in the uh, after the Herald Sun, in which the that newspaper um, surveyed its own survey and gave the results, um, the Herald Sun editorially said, um, "We're coming up to an election later this year." Um, Mr. Napstein and Mr. Andrews, you better listen to what we're saying. Um, we and the readers of our newspaper demand that you take sentencing more seriously and do something about it. So um, the, the pressure from the Herald Sun is increasing, uh, or at least it's being, certainly being maintained, and there's no doubt the politicians listen to it. Um, they have no choice. Uh, unless they were courageous enough to go back to such studies as the Tasmanian one and mm -hmm. on that basis say that there was some wrong. Can I ask a question? Um, you, said, you said, I think, that the government uh, took note of the survey done by the Hill of Sun, the government was behind it. Is that correct or it was... Yes, I did say that. The, the most recent survey uh, was, was a Herald Sun annual event, but in um, when, when the, the, new government, the present government first came into power uh, nearly four years ago, uh, it commissioned the Herald Sun to run a survey. The question was, um, was the government behind uh, the Herald Sun survey? Well, the government certainly was behind, in fact, instigated the survey which the Herald Sun conducted on the government's behalf oh, um, nearly, nearly well, three and a half years ago. <laughs> and that was a survey where I said that the uh, readers were given two paragraphs about 17 different cases and were asked to comment. What do you think of the idea of having general generally shorter sentences and a longer parole period to aid rehabilitation? The question was, what do I think of a um, shorter sentence and a longer parole period? I was going to deal with that, had the time allowed. It's a good question. Um, in an ideal world, uh, first sentences would be, in my view, uh, on the side of leniency, because you give someone uh, a first chance or a second chance. Later sentences would um, take into account very seriously uh, any recidivism, any reoffending. Parole um, has been thrown into um, a state of, um, perhaps confused the wrong word, but, but um, since the terrible case of uh, Jill Maher, parole has become much harder to get in Victoria. Uh, properly conducted um, with adequate finance, parole would be a really effective means of ensuring that when prisoners first left in their incarcerated state, they would be properly managed, they would be able to adjust really into the community life. And if they offended, uh, they would go back into prison. But you do need resources, you need properly trained people, um, and setting, getting that into place is something which I know Correction Victoria is responsible for parole is trying to do, but um, in the current state of public opinion, that's difficult. Mm. One, of the, the, one of the drivers for the media and the public's uh, 
diverge from longer sentences is the fear that letting the murderer out on the streets again to commit murder again or letting the child sex offender out on the streets again to commit the offence again where there is maybe a high risk of recidivism is what's probably driving them more than the punitive aspect of the sentence. Uh, what would your comment be about that and, and how we can counteract that, that sort of mentality? Well, um, I'm not sure that you need to counteract that mentality uh, where it is restricted to um, concern about the safety of the community or the protection of the, of the community against those who are likely to um, seriously re-offend. And that is probably true of a very large proportion, if not the majority, of sex offenders. Most murderers murder those whom they know, and there's very little recidivism in murder. There are the king, the, uh, the uh, uh, killers who, the contracts, um, will do their terrible deeds, and they need to be very carefully um, uh, kept in, in uh, kept incarcerated. Prison does have an important protective element. If um, the prisoner is dangerous, I've got no problem about that at all. Um, but in the end, even murderers um, get out, most of them. Sex offenders um, create real problems. Um, about seven years ago, there were three who were held in detention after the sentence had finished. Now there's something like 105, and they cost a huge amount. But it's arguable that that cost is justifiable because of the danger they present to the general public. Most of them are, are held in what's in effect house um, detention in Ararat. Judge, the Attorney General recently quoted $105,000 a year. Per prisoner. Per prisoner. Or per detainee, yes. You've identified a problem, and it's clearly a problem in lots of other areas too. But how do we counter the influence of the popular press? The question is how do you counter the influence of the popular press? It's extraordinarily difficult. Um, I, um, I was delighted to be asked to speak tonight on this topic because it's something about which I've been very concerned for some time. And I thought of some small opportunity to say something to a very intelligent and um, very well-informed audience. Uh, if you can spread the word, that would be wonderful. But it is very difficult, and I don't know what the solution is. I'm just going to take one more question, I'm afraid. Um, so I think we'll go over this side. I'm sorry to those of you. I'll just ask a very quick one, uh, another lighter one. Uh, what is the prospect of uh, a news corporation um, um, Tabloid. Tabloid. <coughs> being embarrassed. <laughs> 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 the media always have the last say. Yeah. It's terribly hard to embarrass the media. Media Watch did a pretty good job. Um, and as I said, Media Watch wrote to the Sun about the newspaper reaction to the Tasmanian Secretary Report. And that reaction, the, the editor's response, was, as I indicated, he just didn't care. Uh, and he um, managed to give a response which was totally unresponsive. Mm -hmm.